Hi, my name is Ursula Hobson. Today I'm going to be demonstrating all the techniques that go into creating a beautiful French mat like this one. I'll begin by showing you how to draw the lines onto the mat. Then I'll show you how to paint the bevel of your mat. Next, we'll put in a watercolor wash. And finally, I'll show you how to mount papers like this handmade marbled paper and this gold tape onto your mat. Now, all these techniques are based on traditional methods, but with a lot of innovations that really make the job quite easy. And I'm sure that even experienced French matters are going to find a lot of helpful tricks. We'll begin in a minute by marking out the lines onto the mat. First of all, your most important tool is your ruling pen. This is what you'll be using to draw your lines. This happens to be a Kohinoor pen, but any good quality pen will be fine. I like this one because it has a numbered dial, and that will help you to keep track of the width of your lines. It also has a blade that flips open, and that makes it very easy to clean. You'll also need some rulers. These have a raised back, and that's to keep the ink from flooding underneath the ruler. This is a wonderful little tool. It's a marking gauge, and it's usually used by carpenters, and it has a metal pointer in here. I've replaced this with lead, so you have to get the kind that has the nut here so that you can remove the pointer and replace it with lead. And you can also get these with a pencil that it fits in there. You'll need some brushes. This is a number six watercolor brush, and this is used to put your watercolor wash in. This is called a shader. It's a flat, thin brush that's fairly wide, and this is used to paint your bevel. Then you'll need some different types of paints. You need some good quality watercolors. I happen to like a little dry kit like this, because it's easy to have all your colors available at once. But you can also get little tubes of watercolor like this. You'll need some acrylics. I use acrylics for the lines. So get a selection of acrylics. And also some gouache paints. A gold tempera like this is good for lines and some white gouache. Then you'll need some miscellaneous things. Um, a dust brush, some scrap mat boards, a razor blade, an eraser, scissors, You'll want some little cups for mixing your paints in and some water. And of course, a pencil and a notepad. And finally, you might want to get a tacking iron. You could also use a household iron, but the tacking iron makes it a lot easier. And we'll be using this to mount our marble papers. And that's about it for the tools. You can see you don't need a very wide range of uh, equipment for this project. And uh, get all your tools together before you begin. And we'll start with the line in the next segment. Now, according to my notes, the first line is a quarter inch from the opening of our mat. The mat is three and a half inches wide, so we take our gauge, subtract a quarter inch, and set it at three and a quarter inch. Then we can move the, uh, slide the mat off the edge of the table and proceed to mark it. You want to take your, get a nice steady grip on your marking gauge and very lightly mark your mat. You don't want your pencil lines to be too dark. Picture a uh, 45 degree angle through here and start and stop your lines at that point. If you overlap a little bit, that's fine too. Go all the way around. Now the next line will be 3 eighths of an inch from that line. So we subtract an additional 3 and an eighth of an inch. And go ahead and mark that. I've seen a lot of people do French mats with a little jig that fits into the corner, which leaves little pinholes all the way across the mat. And uh, this is a much easier way to do it. It's easier to line up your ruler with the uh, lines. It's more accurate. I'm simply going along and just subtracting the number, the space between the lines. Now these pencil lines, if they're too dark, will show through your paint because the lines are put on with a fairly thin uh, consistency. So make sure you keep them soft. Our next line is 5 eighths of an inch. This is where our wash is going to go, so we have a fairly wide space here.
Then I put a line that's a sixteenth of an inch beyond that. Don't be afraid to use sixteenths on your designs. You really make a difference. You don't want anything too consistent. Variety makes the mat a much more interesting design. Now we're going to leave a space for the marbled paper, which is half an inch. The marbled paper will actually be cut at 3 eighths of an inch. You want to leave a little space on either side of it before you get to the next line. That's the last line and we're ready to start putting the lines on with the ruling pen. We'll begin by mixing the paint for the lines that we'll be ruling on the mat. Obviously you want to match a color in the print. I'm going to pick up this purple color in the flower. So you squeeze out a little bit of acrylic. You don't need very much. It's a little purple. I don't want it to be quite purple. I'll lean it towards the red a little bit. And then I'm going to put out a little green because I always like to dull the color slightly with the complementary color. Now those of you that have done French mats before will be wondering why I'm using acrylic at this point. The reason is that once the acrylic dries, the lines will be completely waterproof, which means that you can lay your watercolor wash in after the lines have been drawn on the mat. And you'll find when you get to that point that it's much easier to do that. Uh, the uh, acrylics, when they're watered down, virtually look like watercolor. You really can't tell the difference. I also put a little tiny bit of the white placa in my cup first because I find it makes it much easier to read the color. There we have a very bright purple. It's getting a little closer to what I want. And this is about all the color you'll need for one mat. You need very little. Now, since you're just beginning, you won't want to start rule, ruling your lines right on your mat. You definitely would want to practice on a scrap mat board until you get the hang of using the ruling pen. Um, also, you want to test your color because it looks completely different in the cup. It'll have a tendency to look quite a bit darker when it's on the line. You want to thin that down to a watercolor consistency. Now that you've got your paint mixed, you want to put your artwork away. Line up your ruler on your first line. This first line is going to be gold tape, so we'll start out here. I've indicated on my note that I want this line to be thin. I like to vary the thickness of the lines. Again, you don't want all the lines to be the same thickness. Now, to load your ruling pen, you want to get the paint in between the uh, blades. So you just brush the bottom half of the blade and the paint will just drop in there, drop down to the point of the blade. And on this ruling pen, a number six is quite a thin line, so that's the line I'm going to do. Just test it for a few strokes to make sure it doesn't drop out on you. Hold your ruler securely. Make sure your fingers are well back from the edge. Place the pen at the first corner and just draw it across. And that's that. Always put your pen down between lines. If you hold it sideways, the, pink, the ink will fall out and I've ruined several mats that way. And you just go to the opposite side. You want to reload your pen. There you go. And then turn your mat. Do the opposite sides. If you get ink on the outside or the back of the pen, just keep a little paper towel handy and just blot it every now and then. If 
If you watch me, you'll notice I always put my little finger down when I'm starting and ending because it makes kind of like a little stop. Now my next line is going to outline my wash line. I usually like to keep them a little thicker. So I'm going to increase the number on my ruling pen to a 9. Line up the ruler first. Move this over to a 9. Reload. Make it an 8. It seems a little thick. There we go. This is a fairly small mat, and so you can go the length of the line without having to reload the pen. On a larger mat, you have to stop in the middle of the line and then reload and continue. If you load, overload the pen, the ink will just come out the end. It will only hold so much paint. And the wider the line, the less paint the ruling pen will hold because the blades are separated more. What I'll do on this next side is I'll stop halfway across and, and reload in the middle of the line. You don't want to let the ink run out completely, so keep an eye on the pen. And when it gets down almost to the end, just lift up. Reload. And then just put the pen down just ahead of where it was before, and you'll see it floods into the other line, and you can't tell at all where the, the join was. to the other side of our wash. Sometimes you may not want to do an entire French mat. A lot of the isolated elements make really nice decorative mats. Just a single line on a mat is really pretty. Often a double mat will be too much color and too heavy for certain things, but a single line, there I've run out of ink, so I'll just reload. Come right back in there. Diplomas and things like that look nice with a double line, say with the school colors on them. It's very nice if you take, when you do a double line, if you make one of them thin and one of them thick and just separate them by a sixteenth of an inch. It's really a pretty border. They can be the same color or they can be different colors. It really looks nice. Okay, now we finished our wash outline, so we'll go back to the thin line, which was my number six. This is why it's handy to have that number dial, because you can go back to the same thickness line very readily.
Being able to do French mats really helps customize your customer's work. You can pick up exactly the right colors in exactly the right proportion. I always find a solid mat board color is a little bit too strong. There again, if you're using a solid mat color, you can break it up with a, a line. You can use an opaque white on a black mat or, or a gold line on a black mat and it really looks striking. Now we're down to our last line. Let's see it. Just about done. What I'm going to do on one of these lines is go over about a quarter of an inch so that I can show you later how to clean up a mistake. It's obviously better not to make mistakes in the first place, but there are some rem remedies for a few of the things that you'll probably go wrong with at the beginning. So I'm just going to go over here a little bit. Now there's no reason why you couldn't just put all your lines this way and all of them this way, but you'd have to wait for them to dry before you could put your opposite sides on. Mm. Often when I'm doing multiple mats where I have to wait anyway, I just do all my lines, all of my other lines, and then it's, you don't have to turn the mat quite as often. We finished with the lines and uh, we're ready to do our bevel next. First of all, you want to thicken your paint a little bit. You don't want it quite as transparent as the lines because it'll look a little spotty. Just add a little paint. And we'll be all set to go. Now this is when you use your wide brush. Get thoroughly load the brush and then offload it slightly. Pick up your mat and you want to reach in and just brush the paint on at the angle of the bevel. Don't start right in the corner. You want to come back when the brush is somewhat dry to do the corner. Need a little more paint. Reload your paintbrush often rather than loading it up too much. If you overload it, it'll blob over the edge of your mat and you'll have to do a lot of sanding later. Continue across and just angle it into the corner. There we go. Turn the mat. With a wide brush like this, you can cover a lot of area and you can do a really neat job. I used to try and do this with my watercolor brush and it just was impossible to do it neatly.
Again, you want to practice on a scrap piece of mat board before you actually do a mat. It takes a very light touch. You don't want to push down too hard on the brush. And here we come into the last corner. And we're done. We're now ready to put in our wash panel, but first we'd like to just clean up the bevel a little bit that we painted, and also we'll be erasing the pencil lines. You want to take a little piece of 220 grit sandpaper and just very lightly sand the top edge of your mat you can see it takes up all the little burrs and all of a sudden it has a nice crisp edge. Just be a little careful in the corners. Whenever you paint the bevel, you want to be careful not to have any overcuts on your mat because the paint will bleed into the overcuts and show up. Now you want to take your eraser and just erase over the top of that. It takes up any of the uh, paint crumbs that are left there now. And also you want to erase your lines, that your overlap lines in your corners. Just about it. Dust all that off. Now we'll have to start by mixing a color for our watercolor wash. So I've brought the print over again. Uh, we're using watercolors this time instead of acrylics. Again, I like to start with a little bit of white placket in the cup. It really helps you read the, the uh, color better. And again, I'm going to use sort of a pinkish purple. So I want to take a little bit of the uh, red here, a little bit of blue, and that's coming up pretty much the way I want. Again, I'm going to add just a tiny bit of green because uh, you don't want your colors too intense, especially with antique prints. You want to keep those colors somewhat subtle. Now in the watercolor wash, you want to really lighten it up a lot. As a matter of fact, the lighter the wash is, the easier it is to apply. You want to really load it up with water. And then you want to do a little test on a scrap piece, because the watercolor wash will change quite a bit as it dries. So you want to take a little test scrap of map board, the same color as what you're working on and paint a little watercolor on there and let it dry. When you do it on the mat, you'll be going around twice, so it'll end up being a little darker than this, but this will give you a good idea. I'm also going to make my wash a little darker than I would normally so that it'll show up for you. Start off with a nice light wash and you'll have a lot more success. Now that looks fine to me, so we'll just get started. Dust the table off one more time. Now you're going to need some nice clean water. Start with a clean brush. Get that brush a little wet and offload it a little bit. And wet that corner. Generally you want to start in the lower right hand corner. It seems to be the corner that last catches your eye when you're looking at something. So if if you do have a little bit of a tide line or something showing, it won't be as noticeable as it would be in another corner. Just stampin' up that corner. Move your artwork out of the way. And then bring your paint close by. This is going to take a little bit of practice, too. Uh, you want to keep your um, panel quite wet. You don't want to let it dry out too much. 
and keep that. Basically, you have just a little bit of a puddle of water, watercolor at the um, beginning of your wash as you go around. If you let it dry out, then you're going to get gradations in the color. You don't want to overload your brush either. It'll flood back into the part that you've uh, already put the watercolor on and leave the tide lines that I was talking about before. really is a lot easier to put a watercolor wash down between two uh, painted lines. The pencil lines are a lot harder to stay between. It seems that the um, acrylic holds the paint in a little bit too. You, want, you don't want to have too much paint when you get to your corner. So it's hard to get it to go around the corner. But Obviously the faster you can do the wash the better because when you get back to your starting point, if it's too dry, you'll, it'll leave a, a mark. Now, the hot lights that I'm working under are drying this very quickly, so you shouldn't have a problem in normal conditions. If you're doing a really large mat or you find that you're not getting around there fast enough, you can try adding just a small amount of diluted sugar water to your water and that'll keep it from drying quite so quickly. And coming up to the last leg. And we'll just keep going. The second coat is a lot easier because you've already got sort of a damp subcoat that you're going over and it really blends nicely. You can go over more than twice. Um, three, the more times you go around, the darker your wash gets, obviously, but Twice is usually sufficient. One thing about doing French mats on rag boards, some of them don't have as much sizing them in them as others do. And uh, they're impossible to do French mats on because the paint soaks in too readily. The lines don't stay crisp, they get all fuzzy. So if that's happening with your rag boards, don't be discouraged, just try another brand. about done now. As you come to the last part, let your brush dry out and if you find you have a little too much paint on it still, just uh, blot it off a bit and then come into your corner. Now because of the uh, hot lights. This has dried up on me fairly quickly, but you can touch that corner up a little bit. You can see where the uh, diagonal line is. And just take a damp brush and just kind of rub it a little bit. And by the time that dries, that'll blend in there quite well. Just blot it a bit. And we finished our wash. It looks a little spotty now, but by the time it dries, it'll be quite even. We finished that part and we're ready for the fun part, which is putting the marbled paper on. Here we have 
the hand marbled paper that we'll be mounting to the mat board. The reason this is so much fun is that the results are quite dramatic. What I've done is taken a piece of dry mounting tissue and mounted it to the back of the marbled paper by putting it in the dry mounting press between two pieces of release paper. Next you want to take a strip of the paper and put it on a piece of scrap mat board. If you have a mat cutter, this next step is quite easy. Otherwise, it's still pretty easy, but you'll have to use your marking gauge and mark out the uh, 3 8 inch strips. In other words, you'll take this, mark out your strips at 3 8 inch intervals, and then use a ruler and a mat knife to cut the strips. With the mat cutter, you simply take it over. You want to cut a small strip off first just to get it started. So I'll put it at half an inch. Let me make it. Cut a little piece off first. Just throw that away. And then we want to cut 3 8 inch strips. Doing it this way avoids using messy glues or spray adhesives. There we have our four strips and we're ready to start putting them on the mat. Bring them over here. Here's our mat. I've got the uh, tacking iron heated up. It's quite hot. Now I just pull these off one at a time. You want to line it up in that space with a little bit of space on either side. Then just hold it in place with your fingers and tack between your fingers. It only takes a second. You don't want to tack your corner because you'll be cutting that later while it's overlapping and it'll be the last thing to be tacked down. Now you just want to Tack that down, turn, already the mat's getting pretty exciting. It's when you finally miter the corners though that it really comes together. So you want to overlap that. You can keep an eye on your marbles and line them up in an attractive way. Sometimes there's parts that are more noticeable and you want to avoid those. Marble papers are sold at a lot of art supply stores, but one of the best places to get them is from bookbinding suppliers because they are really meant to be used on the inside of books. There's quite a few people in this country now making beautiful marble paper. This one's made by Iris Nevins, who lives in New Jersey. There we are on the last side. You can see how easy this is. This takes practically no practice whatsoever. When you're tacking this down, you have a tendency to rub it. Don't do that because it'll slide the uh, paper off of your backing. You want to just go straight down and press lightly. There we go. Now just take a ruler. I'm going to put it face down this time. And just line it up with the inside and the outside corner. And score it lightly a few times until you've gone through both pieces. And just pull them out. There's your first corner already done. There we go. 
And one more corner. There we go. Now, you want to just tack that back down. At this point, it's best just put it back in the press and really set it. Or take a piece of release paper and lay it over the whole thing and rub it with your tacking iron. You could use a household iron to do this, but obviously the tacking iron's a little handier. All right, there we have our marble paper mounted to the mat. And as you can see, it's quite beautiful. We'll simply put a little piece of gold tape around the opening here, and we'll be all done. Now the gold paper, I prepared it the same way that I prepared the marble paper, and I cut it into 1 16th inch strips. This is a gold wrapping paper that I've antiqued slightly by taking an acrylic and applying it with a sponge to streak the uh, gold paper slightly. Again, it's also backed with the uh, dry mounting tissue. This you want to line up with the pencil line that we left at the opening. It's a little bit trickier because it's somewhat more flexible than the marble paper, but basically do it uh, the same way that we did the uh, marble paper. Tack it lightly. It doesn't take much to make it stick. And again, be careful not to rub it across. There we go. The other way to get a little gold on your mat is to use the gold placa that we looked at before. This looks really nice with a gold frame because you have a transition into the artwork because of the gold being repeated. Another way this paper is sometimes antiqued is by taking a spatter brush and just spattering burn umber acrylic on it, watered down quite a bit. Now we're just about done. I'm sure by now you're getting pretty excited and are anxious to try this yourself. There we go. I'm pretty sure I can claim this uh, mounting technique as my own invention. I don't know of anybody else that does it this way. Especially with these thin little strips, it's really hard to get them on with glue. All done. This won't shrink back the way the mylar tapes do. It'll really stay intact. All right, before we finish up, I'd just like to show you how to trim out the corner that we intentionally overrode earlier. You want to take a ruler and a mat blade, line it up on the edge of the override, and just score it very lightly. Do the opposite edge. Basically, you're just outlining it by scoring it very lightly. And then you want to just pick it a little bit, and that'll lift right off of there. Now, it's not totally invisible, but it's 
usually adequate to save it. Again, you prefer to do it perfectly the first time, but if you do have a little mistake, that'll solve that problem. Now the mat's ready to be hinged to the artwork. Here's the mat hinged to the botanical. Remember when you're drawing your lines not to overload your ruling pen. And when you're painting your bevel, don't get too much paint on the face of the mat. Also, when you're laying in your wash, keep it nice and wet as you move along. And finally, when you're putting your marble paper on, remember not to tack that corner until you've had a chance to miter that corner. I'm sure you'll find that all the techniques described in this tape are quite easy to master. And once you're able to offer French mats to your customer, I'm sure that you'll find the rewards considerable, both financial and especially personally.